Human. Les humains à leur meilleur. <rire> C'est toi pour Héro. Oh man, we have a special one today, everyone. I didn't want to release this as a podcast, but hey, why not? I had some of the superheroes of meat eating in one film studio, so I had to take advantage of this opportunity and let everyone hear the audio version. You'll see this on the big screen, in Food Lies and maybe even other places someday. We shot it in our production studio, which belongs to my sapien.org business partner who is producing Food Lies with me. To set the scene a bit, it's a large warehouse and we're sitting in the middle on director chairs with three cameras filming. We hit seven main topics based around meat. We started off high level for a general audience to ease in. Why should meat be included as a part of a healthy diet? We went all the way into details of a carnivore diet and should it be nose to tail or just steak and eggs? We also talked about how much plant food we should include in our diet. I always include some, and Mark Sisson used to recommend including a lot. Seems like things are changing though. So I definitely agree with the nose to tail meat eating approach. So much so that I named my grass finished meat company after it. We have grass finished beef, buffalo and lamb, as well as pasture raised pork and chicken. Our pork and chicken has been tested in an independent lab and has one of the best omega-6 omega-3 ratios around. It's around 1.5 to 1, which is amazing. Most conventionally raised pork is 20 to 1, and conventionally raised chicken is about 24 to 1. You can see the results on nosetail.org and also place an order. It's shipped out to all 48 contiguous U.S. states each week on Monday and Tuesday. We also have ground beef, buffalo, and pork with organ meats mixed in. You get liver, heart, kidney, and spleen all grass finished and all mixed in so you barely taste it. If you can't support me in this way, you can join the Patreon and get the extended show notes for the podcast each week at patreon.com slash pcumen and get invited to the private Slack group while also keeping the show ad-free. We're in the final days of filming for Food Lies. People keep asking me when it will be released and unfortunately I don't know. We've been editing it for months and keep finding great new experts and stories to add. The world is changing by the day as well and it's hard to find a cutoff for what content to include in the film. Do we include the news that there's glyphosate in the Beyond Meat Burgers? What about Mickey Bendor's latest study on human evolution and meat eating? Anyway, it's close to being finished, but we still need to do a ton of graphics to illustrate all of these points and make these big concepts easier to understand, so it'll take some time. We just got back from an incredible film tour in Calgary, Toronto, and Ottawa. Some awesome farmers and ranchers doing some great things for the land, the animals, and dispelling vegan propaganda. So much of the land on earth just isn't suitable for crops. It works perfectly for cattle and other ruminant animals. Anti-meat activists are so clueless when it comes to this. It's a real shame. We're about to head out for the very last shoots in San Diego, July 24th through 27th, based around the Low Carb USA conference. Some great doctors will be in town that will be getting in the film. Come say hi. I'll be at the conference for a bit. We'll also have our meetup there on Wednesday, July 24th in downtown San Diego with Dr. Paul Saladino and ex-vegan turned carnivore Elise Parker from the last episode. RSVP at nosetail.org slash event. Can't wait to see everyone there. Now, here's the mighty meaty men themselves, Mark Sisson, Dr. Paul Saladino, and Dr. Sean Baker. All right, we're here to talk about meat. So while most people in the world are talking about cutting down meat at every meal, you guys are talking about maybe increasing it. So why should meat be included in a healthy diet? Um, I'll start by saying meat's always been included in a healthy diet. Meat is what humans evolved uh, as a primary source of protein. And we're not just talking about ribeye steaks and tenderloin, but we're talking about eggs and newts and absolutely small animals as well as large animals. We're talking about uh, insects, which was uh, you know, part of that protein offering that uh, for two and a half million years, you know, we took in in order to stay alive and build muscle and have the energy that we have to, to get to where we are today. So meat is 100% part of a healthy diet. In fact, I'd be hard pressed to name a society or a group of people that ever survived without some form of animal protein. Exactly. Like Mark is saying, if you look at the size of the human brain, it exploded, not literally, but figuratively. It grew quite rapidly around two million years ago, and most scientists agree that was the advent of humans, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, eating meat, eating animals. And that, I think, nutrition shaped the way that our brains could develop in a very profound way. If you look at 
sources of bioavailable nutrients, animal foods are clearly far and away the best of those. A lot of times plant-based advocates will tout nutrients in plants, but if you just look at the facts regarding the bioavailability and the presence of nutrients, animal foods are clearly the winner for those. And that would suggest you know, why the human brain grew so rapidly once we had access to these incredibly rich sources of bioavailable nutrients of all sorts, eating animals became this key to sort of unlock our continued evolution as humans, and it continues to be a huge part of what makes us healthy today. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we are uniquely adapted to digest and process meat. I mean, we have transporters in the gut that are uniquely designed to take up dye and tripeptides that are coming from meat. I mean, if we look at, we were primates, you know, we evolved as a primate, and there are primates that have been eating fruit for 25 million years or more, and their brain hasn't developed, and so something had to change. And, and you know, you're right, uh, the discovery of either first maybe possibly scavenging meat and then eventually learning how to organize and hunt drove uh, much of that evolution. And, and, and we, are, we haven't changed. There hasn't been enough time to turn us back into herbivores, which some people are trying to do now, which is kind of crazy. Where did we go wrong, though? Where did we get lost on this way when this is something we've been doing for all of history? I mean, I might suggest that um, first agricultural revolution 10,000 years ago would be a sort of a starting point of our going wrong. We were hunter-gatherers up until that point. We lived in small tribes. We moved from place to place you know, because there was no way to store food. It was literally a full-time job to be scavenging, hunting, and gathering. And again, we're talking about, you know, not just root shoots and berries and nuts, but, you know, small animals, birds, lizards, snakes, as well as whatever we could kill, and certainly scavenging. I mean, uh, a lot of uh, anthropologists would say that our ability to feast on a, a previous kill was, you know, to be able to kind of sneak up and maybe scare the other predators away. Um, our ability to access uh, marrow by, some say the first real tool was a, was a hammer to crack open marrow and get at that, those juicy ingredients in there. But about 10,000 years ago, someone discovered that we could grow, take these seeds and grow grains, which was a great source of calories and allowed us to stay in one place and allowed us not to have to move around from one um, ecological environment to the next, but stay fixed and as a result have more children and have more people to work the earth and create civilization and societies. And so I'd say that's where we started to go wrong. And then what happened was the cheap source of calories started to supplant the quality of nutrients that we were getting largely from the broad variety as hunter-gatherers. Mm. There's a well-known uh, scholar, Jared Diamond, who wrote Guns, Germs, and Steel. He called the advent of agriculture the worst mistake in human history, and he's termed it the cult of the seed. If you look at the paleoanthropology evidence from the Dixon Mounds and all these other fossilized records of people around that time that Mark is talking about, the health of humans clearly rapidly deteriorated once we became agrarians. There's evidence of many nutrient deficiencies, many infectious diseases, hyperostosis of the skull, which is probably due to deficiency of multiple minerals and vitamins, and the skeletons got smaller, they were more fragile. There's plenty of evidence to suggest that that was a really, really bad thing for us to do. Well, I mean, and also, yeah, also our brain size shrunk. I mean, yeah. we, see, we see that our brain went down by about 200 cc's. I mean, it peaked, uh, some would say about 150,000 years ago to about 1,500 cc's, and now modern Homo sapiens is about 1,300. And so that probably coincides with, I mean, some of our, basically our, some of our food supply ran out. I mean, there are people who make the argument that, you know, we were eating fattier sources of meat at some point, you know, particularly megafaunal animals. And if we look at the work of Felisa Smith out of University of New Mexico, uh, she shows that the average size at the beginning of the Pleistocene about 125,000 years ago was about 500 kilograms. That was an average mammal size. And now, currently, it's about nine kilograms. And so we had a tremendous loss of animal mass available to us to eat. And so as that occurred, then we became, fortunately, we were smart enough to figure out how to harness some calories from grain and other foods and it's kept, it sustained us and it kept us alive as, as, a, as a population and it continues to do so today, but it doesn't help us to thrive optimally. It's really a suboptimal source of nutrients. It can give us calories, but they're not very nutrient rich or bioavailable. It's a good news, bad news situation for the human body, which is so resilient and we're able to go long periods of time without eating um, the optimal diet. We can survive, but we can't thrive. And the, during the Irish potato famine, people lived for six months at a time on shoe leather and seaweed. You know, it wasn't an ideal source of nutrients in any way, shape, or form, but it kept people alive. So to our, you know, to our credit, we evolved these different systems by which we could extract energy from different substrates. But that does not mean that it was either what we evolved and what our genes expect today, or 
that it's an ideal situation for us today? Well, I think, you know, the capacity, because again, we most people agree that there's an evolution happening. I know there's people that disagree with that, but if we assume we evolved as some sort of primate, you know, we had that capacity prior to, and we maintained some of that, and then we developed through, you know, a more carnivorous pattern, the system that we have today. And so we still retain some of that capacity. Like some of the vegans will point out the only reason we have color vision was because we were plucking fruit out of the trees. Well, I'm like, well, that might have been true 30 million years ago. And why would we lose that? There'd be no advantage to losing that. So we retain that from then, but we don't, you know, we don't need that at this point. We didn't develop this shoulder, this throwing arm uh, to throw rocks at bananas. I mean, that's not why that happened. I think there's a pretty clear difference between food that's survival food and food that's optimal for humans. Yeah, so but what about people who say that animals we have now are not what we ate in the past? They're trying to make all these claims that there's somehow these toxins or this way we're raising cattle makes them bad for some reason. I mean, just because we're grain finishing a cow, does that necessarily make it bad or harmful? Well, I mean, there's a point to be made there that the way that we produce animals now for this industrial big food marketplace that we've created for ourselves can be problematic. And I would uh, agree with anyone who says that, you know, animals need to be fed their native diet, they need to be treated humanely, they need to be killed humanely, we need to look after the land, it needs to be sustainable over time. You know, those are all great arguments, and I don't think anyone here would, would argue against that. But, you know, when you have a, an animal that is grown on its native diet in a sustainable way, grown humanely, I think that's, that would be an example of you know, what our genetic recipe expects from the millennia. The, I don't think there's that much difference in a modern auroch, a modern, you know, a, a, a cow uh, or a sheep from 50,000 years ago in that regard. I think people overestimate that as well. I mean, even grain-fed cattle spend 85% of their life on pasture and they're grain-fed at the end. And I think as Mark is saying, most people would agree that you know raising an animal on pasture for the majority of its life is the ideal thing. Whether or not that's you know doable with the population we have now, et cetera, is a whole different argument. But I think that the majority of cattle spend the vast majority of their lives in pastured fields, and so I, I don't think there's any major difference or any big problems with eating cattle like we're raising today. I don't think that they're toxic in any way. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think you know. Like I said, meat has been meat for two million years as far as humans go, or more, even arguably longer. And so I think that if we compare that to other foods that we eat now, we look at even some of the hybridized fruit that we have, it resembles nothing like what it would have been even 10,000 years ago, or even 2,000. Most vegetables today, I mean, broccoli, hell, wasn't even introduced in the United States until 1920. And, and you know, this is stuff where people think we've been eating it for millennia, we haven't. And so, but clearly we've been eating, unless those caves in Lesko and all these other fossil records are, are, were graffiti, which I don't think they were. I mean, those, in my view, I mean, I think that was a menu. I mean, I think that's yeah, what that was. That was a restaurant with a menu on there. That's a great point. I think the animals that we're eating today are much more similar to the animals we would have eaten than the plants we're eating today. Sure, yeah, absolutely. There's this idea, you know, you walk down the grocery store aisle, and I think people are, we misunderstand the abundance of edible plant foods in our environment based on what we see in the grocery store. Most of what we see is hybridized, most of what we see is genetically engineered or has been bred in a certain way to be bigger and sweeter in terms of fruits or more edible. So many of the foods we eat now, like Sean is saying, were never available to us even 50, 75,000 years ago as humans. You couldn't just walk in the forest and just grab a leaf or grab a fruit. There, nothing was available. I mean, occasional tubers and seasonal small fruits, which were nothing like what we see today. So plants are very different than they used to be. Well, I think that's a very important point to talk about even optimal foraging theory. Like we studied this and we know that hunter-gathered tribes didn't go for these leafy greens because they didn't have any calories in them barely. So there was no point to get them. These, they went for animals, they went for honey. I mean, these are sources of calories and tubers. So a lot of people don't recognize the fact that these leafy greens have not been around for that long. You know, many of the roots are toxic. Some of them are edible. Yeah, this fruit is very seasonal depending on the type of climate and the latitude that you're at and fruit it didn't look like we have now anymore. Many of the things we eat were frankly toxic in the past. Well, Potatoes, I, almonds, these are all remnants of toxic foods. I mean, if we want to account for the facts that humans have colonized every inch of the earth, basically, I mean, and we started, you know, arguably in Africa and, you know, Eastern Africa, to make it from one part to the other, the only consistent food that would have been available is some sort of animal. I mean, you can't, if we're going to say we must eat X type of plant, you better show that it exists in all latitudes, in all climates, and all throughout the year. Otherwise, you can't make that claim. And what you can say is, if there's an animal there, humans will exploit that. And I mean, you know, 
to my point that we are the only species that has eaten whales and cows and lions and sheep and you know flies and birds. I mean, there's no other animal that can do that. And so we are the ultimate predator. I mean, that's just who we are as a species. I mean, we need to accept that and embrace that. And meat is a huge part of what we are and what made us who we are. Well, if humans had the requirements for eating these leafy green type things, then how do we even exist? Because like you said, they weren't available in so many parts of the world. So you said in the past that we should be making, you know, maybe half our plate vegetables. Do you still believe that? What is your thinking that these days? Yeah, so um, I've, my thinking has shifted a little bit. Um, with the advent of this carnivore diet, and, and I think in large part due to these gentlemen here, I've shifted that thinking around a little bit. My um, ideal strategy is to, I, I want to live an awesome life. I want to optimize my health. I want to have the most energy possible. I want to have the, as much muscle mass well into my future as possible. I don't want to have any micronutrient deficiencies. And so I think the, the, uh, my initial uh, sort of generic template showed that maybe if you made vegetables the base of your diet and then added protein, meat, right on top of that, and then, you know, whatever else, green leafies and, I mean, uh, condiments and whatever on top of that, healthy fats, uh, that you'd be in good stead, that you would, would not be making any glaring errors in your attempts to achieve good health. Personally, I've dropped the amount of uh, vegetables that I consume on a daily basis. And it's interesting, not so much of necessity and, th and thinking that vegetables are bad, but I've realized as I've gotten more and more into a uh, sort of a keto lifestyle, a ketogenic state, and I've appreciated my ability to become a fat-burning beast, I've refined my met metabolic flexibility, I find that I need fewer calories. That's probably the greatest aha I've had in the last five years. I need fewer calories to maintain energy, maintain muscle mass, not get sick, and most importantly, not be hungry. I don't want to be hungry either. Mm -hmm. So when I've removed, I want to keep my protein at whatever, 100, 120 grams a day. Um, I want to keep my, my fats at maybe 100 grams a day. And then all I'm doing is sort of removing some of the vegetables that I was eating to the extent that might, I might have one or two servings of vegetables a day once in a while, some days not have any, and thrive on that sort of a diet. So I'm, whereas I used to think maybe vegetables were an important source of micronutrients um, and fiber, I'm now thinking maybe fiber isn't the big thing that I thought it was. Maybe I'm thinking that, that as we look at micronutrients, maybe we ought to pull back and, and understand that micronutrition and that whole, the, you know, the government's figuring of the RDAs in the 1940s was based on a, an assumption about a diet that was completely skewed from what we evolved on. In other words, that diet that had 6 to 11 servings of grains and uh, was starting to get processed. So maybe we're talking, what we should be talking about is what's the minimum effective dose of vitamins and minerals? And maybe it's not much if we can dial in the rest of our diet and get rid of the processed stuff. And where's the most efficient way to get it? Where's the most concentrated bioavailable way to get it? Animals, multivitamin of, this, of our evolution, best multivitamin in the last three million years. Yeah, I, th I think Mark's point about the, the RDAs, and I've, I've, I've been talking about this for a while, is that you know they're derived on a population that may be completely different to, to what you and I or any of us are doing. And so we have to look at, does a baseline diet affect your nutrient requirements? And I, and I would say a, a diet that's high in carbohydrates increases your nutrient requirements. And I think a lot of reasons why we see nutrient deficiencies is we're eating a diet that's driving those requirements up and at the same time putting food in there that impede, you know, fiber is going to interfere with, with mineral absorption. You know, certain uh, plant compounds, you know, well, we're of oxalates and phytic acid, which will, which will bind to calcium, zinc, magnesium, and other iron and other minerals. And so we have to say that the RDAs may not apply equally to all people. And in fact, the Institute of Medicine reviewed the, IR, the RDAs back in 2007. They said the level of evidence that these are based on is basically expert opinion, which is basically the lowest level we have. So the entire field of nutrition based on RDAs is based on kind of somebody's guess. And so mm -hmm. it's kind of like, you know, where are we at? And I think that kind of segues a little bit into the next question about what are the problems we have with current nutrition science? Exactly. I was just going to ask, it's all based on this bad diet. So what do we do? How do we change that? Or, or at least explain to people why that's a bad thing to base it on a diet that is just filled with six to eight servings of grains. Well, so that's, that's the huge question. That's the huge hurdle and uh, challenge that we have uh, because we're trying to undo 60 years of governmental intervention in our lives and uh, bad science that for a different topic on a different day, we can go back to 
you know, this, the seven countries study that Ansel Keys did, which sort of was the, was the ground zero of, uh, of where we are with the whole food pyramid today. Um, this phobia that we had of fats for so long that was misplaced and misguided, this phobia of cholesterol and being, you know, the devil incarnate when in fact it's one of the most important molecules in the human body. I mean, we can point to a lot of uh, mistakes that we made collectively as a society over the past 60 or 70 years. So really the issue for me is, you know, how do we explain human nutrition in a way that calls upon evolution, calls upon modern genetic science to show that certain, you know, upregulate in certain enzyme systems, we can turn on certain genes that are benefiting us and maybe turn off the genes that the body would have resorted to in another sense because we were just giving it the wrong signals from poor food choices. I don't have the answer, like, how do we shift it? If I could today, I know we all would right now, we'd all say, okay, this is, this is how everyone needs to eat, and I guarantee you we could, we could lop a trillion dollars off the annual health budget right now. But this gets into the meat of a very complex situation, which is when you start to go up against somebody's way of eating, it's almost more aggressive than arguing religion with that person because it's a choice that they made early on and they're trying to defend. And so it's, it's a, I think, our biggest challenge. You asked earlier, where do we go wrong? And Mark brought up the fact it was probably 10,000 years ago. And then he, I think he's bringing up another great point here that it, the second place we went wrong was 70 years ago. And so we've had these multiple errors in judgment and in terms of interpretation of the science. I think between 10,000 and the last 70 years, we probably figured some stuff out again. And if you even go back 100 years, plates looked a lot different in terms of the, and the prioritization of foods was different. People appreciated meat, they appreciated eating animal foods. And in the last 70 years, we took a really hard left turn in the wrong direction. And I think that that is what Mark is talking about. That is sort of the nutritional propaganda, for lack of a better word, the nutritional ethos that we're trying to undo. And it's based on bad science. It's mostly based on observational epidemiology rather than actual interventional studies. And that has really led us astray in many ways. Perhaps there was a political agenda, perhaps there were financial agendas at stake there, but I really feel like the American public, the westernized world in general, and there's really a contrast between the westernized and easternized world in this, uh, in this sense, but the westernized world has really been led astray by these, these nutritional ideas that were based on observational studies that were poorly conducted and misinterpreted, and we have forgotten the things that made us who we are as humans and the, the most nutrient-dense foods, and we're sort of in this crazy twilight zone now thinking that, that we should be eating bamboo burgers. Well, it seems like any study that shows that meat causes cancer, meat is unhealthy in any way, it's just saying to me what else they're eating and what else in their lifestyle is bad. Well, those are all epidemiology studies, right? And I think this is something that is not appropriately done by the media. Oh, it's dirty science. It is, it's, and it's dirty reporting. Yeah. It's dirty science and it's dirty media. It's kind of fake news, as some might say. You know, the general public has jobs that are not as scientists or epidemiologists, and the media does nothing to educate them to the fact that these studies are not interventional, they're observational, they involve studies, they involve uh, samplers, they involve questionnaires, they're either prospective or retrospective. You know, you don't hear on Fox News or CNN, well, you know, this is a study and it shows eating one half serving of meat per week is gonna shorten your life by 10 years or something. They don't say, this is epidemiology, this is correlation, not causation. They don't say, you know, there's this thing called healthy user bias and unhealthy user bias. We wanna educate you about all these things. Let's just take a moment, you know, a break from our commercials and we're just gonna tell you how to interpret an epidemiology study and that's what needs to be done. And that's never done. It's just dirty reporting and it's dirty science with an agenda in mind and they're trying to push an agenda with these studies and the public is really misled because if you look at it, there are plenty of interventional studies with meat that are a completely different story. They paint totally different stories about the health of animal products. And if you look at epidemiology, that is non-interventional studies that have been done outside of the westernized world, they paint a completely different story because the sort of ethos around animal foods is very different. If you look at epidemiology studies in Asia, the people who eat the most meat are, have the longest life, the lowest rates of cardiovascular disease, the lowest rates of cancer. It's a completely different story, but you never hear about that on the news. And the newscasters are never saying, you know, we're scratching our heads here because there's these conflicting studies, but we want to tell you about this one. It's never like, it's just a sensational headline. It's really, in my opinion, it's pandering, it's clickbait. Do you, do you think there is a, you know, a financial incentive to push people towards these more processed foods and, and off? Uh, because we saw that, you know, even going back in, as far as the 1920s when Procter & Gamble lobbied the American Heart Association with a million dollars, which a lot of money back then, by the way, uh, to promote Crisco and get the lard out. And every time we've seen that animal products 
animal energy has been removed from the system, whether it's, whether it's butter, whether it's lard, and now potentially meat itself, we see a replacement of a processed version of that. Do you think, and, and, and obviously these processed foods, these quote unquote plant-based foods, I think that is just a, another way to say cheap and profitable, but uh, do you think that's going on? Do you think there's any of that? I certainly think it could be. I think sometimes, I don't want people to label us conspiracy theorists, and I think sometimes people, you know, when we're talking about this, people marginalize or they say, oh, those guys are just conspiracy theorists. I think it's totally possible. There's a lot of money at stake here, and Beyond Burger just had an incredibly large jump in their stock, and clearly a lot of people are making a lot of money. And I mean, this extends as far as, the, you know, the cholesterol, the lipid hypothesis, the statin industry, the pharmaceutical industry. It's totally possible, you know? Just what we know about humans is that when there's a lot of money on the line, humans do nefarious things. I think it's possible. I don't know what we do about it. I think it's totally possible. <laughs> and it's a scary possibility. Okay, let's jump to the ratio of plant to animal foods. So you guys are heavy meat eaters. We have some carnivores over here. Sounds like you're heading more that direction. He's carnivore-ish. Carnivore adjacent. Carnivore I'm, I'm adjacent. carnivore adjacent myself, I guess. So how do we... You are, you're carnivore I adjacent. mean, it, literally I am, yeah. How do we know what we should be eating though? I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, you gotta do what works for you. And everyone's like, everyone's a delicate snowflake, you know, I love to eat bananas only and that's my thing. But how, how do well, we... you know, know, so we can start with, with sort of, um, again, a thought experiment and, and ask the, the essential question, is a carnivore diet the ideal diet? You know, and let's start from that and, yeah. and maybe work backwards. And I'll pose that to, uh, to Paul first. Well, I mean, my perspective on this is that, kind of like we were talking about from human evolution. If we look at human evolution, I think that we've talked about the idea that humans began eating animals two million years ago, 2.5 million years ago. That was a key player in our evolution and the size of our brains. The nutrients found in animals was so crucial to who we became as humans. And then if you just kind of reverse engineer it, if you think, Mark kind of suggested this earlier, how do I get all my micronutrients? How do I get them in the most bioavailable forms? I like this kind of thought experiment of just not even asking people what they think the ideal diet is, but I would, I would challenge people with the question, would they agree that the ideal diet would be completely nutrient replete, so having all the nutrients that a human needs in the most bioavailable forms with the absence of toxins? So to me, that's just, can we agree that that is a definition of a good diet or perhaps the ideal human diet? Like, if we accept that, then I think it follows based on my research, Sean's research, Mark's research, and I think it's, it gets to be almost indisputable <laughs> that an animal-based diet is going to satisfy that. You have all the nutrients that a human needs to thrive in the most bioavailable forms, and there are none of the plant toxins. As far as we're aware, now with nutritional science in 2019, there are no toxins naturally occurring in animals. The idea of toxins with cooking animals is different, we can talk about that, but there are no toxins naturally occurring in animals like there are in plants who use those toxins as defense chemicals. So if we accept that this is a reasonable definition of an ideal diet or a nutrient-rich uh, diet or a diet that could promote human health, I think it's totally plausible to imagine that, a, that an animal-based, in my opinion, a nose-to-tail carnivore diet meets that uh, very well. Now the nuance for me personally comes in with the fact that I think that as humans we are individual and that some people can probably tolerate more or less plants on top of that. And that can create variety or colors or whatever. I don't think humans need that to obtain all these nutrients that are bioavailable, but if they want to eat those things, some people can tolerate more of those than others. And what we seem to observe is that some people don't tolerate them well at all. And some people feel the best when they eliminate completely. Some people can tolerate a little bit, but it gives a little freedom for people to say, you know what? I know there's really maybe not anything good for me in this lettuce or nothing I'm not getting in the meat and animal organs that I'm eating, but I'm gonna have a salad because I like it or because I'm just gonna have some variety and that's probably fine. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, I guess just my opinion, uh, a nose to tail carnivore diet could be a construct of an ideal human diet to which people could add plant foods that they tolerate as they want to with the idea that they would have some sense of where the toxins would be in those foods and eliminate those most toxic plants and kind of titrate according to them. Like I said, some people might do best on no plant foods who have uh, severe illness, autoimmune disease, etc. Some people might be able to add in some plant foods and do just fine on that and have some variety there as well. Yeah, I think it's important to realize that, you know, at least in the United States, I mean, 70% of our calories are, are plant-based right now. And, and granted, much of it is grain and sugar and, and seed oils and that stuff, but it's still plant-based. And so we, we currently eat a, 
abysmally small amount. I mean, there's no meat-based diet out there that anybody's, you know, outside of the, the kind of crazy people like us. But I mean, there's no real societies that are eating a meat-based diet outside. You know, I'd say the closest place it would come to that would be possibly Hong Kong, where they eat a pound, pound and a half of meat a, meat a day per capita, which is very large. And interestingly, they have the highest life expectancy in the world, and they have the highest IQ in the world, which you know you can make with that with, with what you will. But um, you know, I think if we were to flip that around, you know, for many people, I, I think we we under eat animal foods, I mean, and we replace it with mostly garbage. You know, it's not that uh, people are going to, you know, replace, you know, they're going to switch over to eating broccoli and kale to, to replace the meat. They're, they're eating, you know, the, the, the junk food out there. And so I think I agree with Paul and, and Mark to some degree, you know, get the minimum amount what you need to, to do what you want to do. And those goals are lean muscle mass, energy, you know, and absence of disease. And you get that from the best source, which I would agree is an animal-based product. And then beyond that, you know, then it becomes, you know, enjoyment, you know, and, and I know you like, to, you like enjoy, you enjoy crunch. And, crunch. And so, yeah. maybe, and crunching bones doesn't work too well. But, <laughs> yeah. but I mean, you know, I and I think, you know, I, I agree with, with Paul and, I, and the way I look at a carnivore diet, I, I, you know, I say prioritize animal-based nutrition and then use, you know, limit or eliminate plants as needed for health reasons. And for some people, it may be a diet that's 50-50, you know, or, but I think most people find that as they go up in animal-based nutrition, their health tends to get better. That's what we're seeing clinically based on observation. And again, there's people that will discount that because they think that people's experiences don't count. I'm, I'm of the opposite opinion. I think that we need to consider how people are actually doing when, we, when they eat that way. I want to go back to, um, you know, you made a point again, which uh, we sort of started out with, which is 70% of people's calories in this country come from grain, sugar, and industrial seed oils. That is horrific because none of those three things, which represent apparently 70% of total caloric intake, um, contains any nutrition of any kind. Other I mean, than calories. Other yeah. than calories. Yeah. And in the case of sugar, it's empty calories, we know. And in the case of industrial seed oils, um, many of those aren't even combustible, but they're incorporated into cell membranes and now are affecting insulin uh, sensitivity. They're having uh, perhaps uh, you know, autoimmune effects. Uh, exacerbated by the inflammatory effects of the grains that people are eating. And if we could convince people, back to the, the question about how do we do this, that get rid of those and go back to eating real food, then you see that the choices of real food, while they're limited in one regard, they're wholesome, they're healthy, they're very satisfying. And I've arrived at that point, as I say, where I, can, I feel like I can get by on 30, 35% fewer calories now than even five years ago not losing muscle mass, not losing energy, not getting sick, and not being hungry. So, so then where are you landing on this ratio, though? Are you letting people decide, or what do you think is optimal? Well, I, I would agree that um, the optimal diet, first of all, top-down, is one where you're getting all of your nutrients from uh, natural nutrient-dense sources. Uh, you're covering all the bases. Uh, you're not getting any toxins as a result of some of the choices you're making. And having said that, if we use animal protein as sort of the ideal, the gold standard of this, certainly covering your bases, I mean, in my case, 110, 120 grams of protein a day. It's really all I need. I don't need more. I can eat more, but I don't need more. In terms of fat, I want to get healthy fats from, uh, you know, some saturated fats, some butter, some coconut oil, some avocado oil, some olive oil, some nuts. Uh, and then as I get down to the, to the vegetables, it's like, is there room left now on my plate, on my palate, for those? Because if I've satisfied my taste buds and my satiety with, by, by taking care of those nutrient-dense, uh, highly satiating foods first, then do I really need to load on lots of bulk and lots of stool-forming, mm -hmm. you know, fibrous material that may or may not even have an impact on my health at all? I totally agree. Well, some of these studies show that this, like a spinach, if it's not refrigerated well, you don't even, the nutrition isn't even there. So what are you even benefiting from this? And I've also found if you're eating this meat, diet, like if you're eating this animal food-based diet like you're talking about, and you cut out those vegetables, you're just as full. I experienced with that. I was like, wait a second, why did I even need it? I'm just as full and I'm eating less calories and I'm getting fitter. If you look at the nutrient bioavailability in plants, it's very poor, disappointingly. People might say, oh, spinach has folate. 
generally, if you look at the B vitamins in plants, they're only about 30% as bioavailable as the B vitamins in animal foods because they're bound to glycoproteins. As Sean mentioned earlier, the same is true for the minerals because of phytates and phytic acid. To say that broccoli has the same amount of calcium as milk or other animal foods is, is ludicrous because it's not bioavailable calcium. So if we look at the bioavailability, I think the bioavailability of nutrients is the great arbiter. That is the great leveler when we're talking about plant versus animal foods. And if you look at that in an objective sense, there's no comparison. And these plant foods we're eating are probably even depleting us of these nutrients. So we might get a small amount from plant foods, but they're just not even comparing to the animal foods in terms of the nutrients that are in them. And then we kind of circle back to the idea of fiber, which Mark mentioned, and that's a whole rabbit hole we could go down. The non, the non-necessity, the non-benefit of fiber in the human diet. And I the think perceived is, benefit. Yeah, from, relative, relative to the know, perceived benefit. Yeah. That is perhaps yeah. the greatest. Yeah. That is a huge disparity. We'll go into it. So we want to talk about some myths here. So yeah, what's the fiber myth? I think the fiber myth is you know began in the 1950s and 1960s with Burkitt, who was a surgeon. He went to Africa. I think he was obsessed with the idea of diverticulosis, which is the outpouching of these muscular or these submucosal layers of the colon through the muscular wall. And he observed that you know indigenous people living in Africa did not have diverticulosis at the rate that he was observing in the United States. It was sort of an epidemic. And then he also observed and correlated that they were taking lots of poops and eating lots of fiber. And so that then thus began the fairy tale of fiber and it's been perpetuated and perpetuated. But if you actually look at the data, the data regarding fiber and diverticulosis would suggest there's no benefit to fiber for diverticulosis. And it, the list goes on and on. If you look at the potential benefit or the question of benefit for fiber and colon cancer or pre-colon cancer lesions, that doesn't show a benefit either. And then if you look at the potential benefit of fiber for hypertension or lipid reduction, that doesn't show a benefit. And then you look at the benefit of fiber for satiety, it doesn't really help that much with satiety. And then if you look at the potential benefit of fiber for, or the question of benefit for fiber for constipation, the studies clearly show that fiber makes you poop more, but it doesn't change the quality of your stool, the pain with stool, or the amount of laxatives that people use. So fiber doesn't resolve constipation. Just because you have more poop doesn't mean you're not constipated. You can still have pain, bleeding, hard stool that's not properly formed from fiber. Dist distension? Yeah, distension and fissures from large stools. That, you know, yeah. Constipation is not an absence of fiber in the human diet. We know that. And so the fiber thing is a great big myth. But whenever I tell people, and maybe Sean gets the same thing, you know, whenever we tell people that we eat a carnivorous diet, the first thing they say is, you don't eat any plants? And you say, yeah. And the next question out of their mouth is, how do you poop? Yeah. And you say, right. well, it, was, it, it works. It just works, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but it's such a cognitive dissonance. People are just not aware of this possibility. Well, it's, I mean, it's the same way a cat or any other animal. I mean, they, they still exactly. make feces. I mean, it's in, in, in we, Mark and I talked this off camera. I mean, it's basically your stool is mostly bacteria yeah. in, in whatever cells you slough off from the, uh, you know, the surface layers of your digestive tract. And that's what it's generally going to be. Um, but I mean, I think the myth about fi some people consider fiber an essential nutrient, and it's not. I mean, there's essential nutrients to me are something, if I don't have it, I'm going to die. And if I don't have enough lysine, I'm going to die. If I don't have enough fatty acids, I'm going to die after a period of time. But, you know, I've gone three years without fiber, and lo and behold, I'm still here. And I, I, I'm aware of people who have gone 20 years or more. And so I think that, uh, you know, some of the points you made, and, you know, Ann Perry did that study in 2020, 2012 looking at colonoscopies on people, and the people that ate the most fiber and had the most bowel movements had the highest rate of diverticulitis, or diverticulosis, rather. And so I think, uh, you know, a myth, and I think most of the beneficial effects we see in fiber, again, go back to epidemiologic observational studies. And it may be a marker for a generally healthier diet. People that are told to eat more fiber are usually going to exercise more, usually not going to smoke less, you know, eat more natural foods. And that effect alone could count for all the benefit we see in fiber. That is the healthy user yeah. bias. Yep. And that is such an important point to note that, again, this goes back to the fact that the media is just not educating people properly that when we're looking at epidemiology studies, these observational studies, we always need to consider the possibility that whether we're looking at increased consumption of fruits and vegetables or increased consumption of fiber, those can often be associated with other healthy behaviors. And it may be the other healthy behaviors that are benefiting those people rather than the fruits and vegetables or rather than the fiber. And there are some really elegant studies that suggest that that's very much the case. There's a study from Britain called the UK Shoppers Study where they looked at vegans, or they looked at vegetarians, I believe, and they looked at the, the comparison of the standard mortality ratio of vegetarians to the general population. And as we see generally in westernized populations, vegetarians have a lower standardized mortality ratio than the general population. And then they did a really smart thing, and they compared 
the death rate ratio, which is a little bit different measure, but they, that was the comparison of the rate of death of those vegetarians to non-vegetarians who also did healthy behaviors. They found people who, you know, who exercised and who didn't smoke and who got sunlight and who did other healthy behaviors, lo and behold, same death rate ratio. So all the benefits of being a vegetarian went away when they compared it to someone who had healthy behaviors. And I would suggest, and I think Sean and Mark would probably agree, that this might, this is probably what we're seeing in all these studies. And again, it's fake news. It's the unfair reporting and this misleading reporting people are doing, you know, we can never say for sure in any of these epidemiology studies, but it needs to be talked about. This is a real problem confounding these studies, and I think this is the same thing with fiber. Mm. We're looking at these healthy user biases, and then on the flip side, the other thing also exists. There's such thing as an unhealthy user bias. The fact that when we see studies saying that meat is bad for you, that meat is associated with decreased longevity, those are the James Dean types who are like, you know what, screw it all. I'm gonna eat meat and smoke and ride my motorcycle and not exercise. Because because in the United States, in the westernized world, we've been told meat is bad for you. So who eats meat? People who are rebels. Mm -hmm. And in the Asian countries, they've been told meat is what rich people eat. So the people that eat meat over there, are, they're seeing it as a health food, or they're seeing it as a reward, or they're seeing it as a status symbol. But in the West, we see meat as a rebellious food. Mm -hmm. You're gonna smoke a cigarette, eat a hamburger, eat some french fries and a bun and have a Coke because you know what? You're fed up with everything. And that is a type of behavior that really makes it hard to separate whether it was the effect of the meat or everything else that person was doing. So, it's all getting into this murky epidemiology and it, it really confuses people and does a great disservice to really sorting out what humans should be doing. That's so interesting. I think that plant foods, these fruits and vegetables, what if the only benefit they're doing is getting you to not eat something worse? What if they have a zero impact and that it's just, it's stopping you from eating processed food or something worse and then the real nutrition comes from the animal foods? But I don't think it does. I don't think, I don't think Anybody eats kale instead of eating a Snickers. Well, yeah. <laughs> some, well no, some people who have, uh, you know, who have the sort of moral high ground in conjunction with a, uh, you know, they're able to uh, change their habits, you know, with a snap of a finger, can suck it up and do that. But that's not a lot of people. But you're, to your point, I mean, that's a start to, you know, I guess eating kale instead of eating, you know, uh, a loaf of white bread would be a step in the right direction. And I think we've sort of headed there. I mean, that was sort of my transition was to a plant-based, uh, not a plant-based diet, but at plants at the, at the base of my food pyramid. And then I'm slowly, you know, pulling those away right now. I want to, because you talk about nose to tail, and I want to, that's an important distinction that I think we ought to make here. Because when people hear about, you know, a meat-based diet and they're thinking, oh, geez, I get to eat ribeyes and, and tenderloins and burgers the rest of my life. Um, it's not quite that simple, is it? Well, I think that from my perspective, it's not. I think that if we look at the way that humans have eaten for the majority of our evolution, 2.5 million years, if we look at the way that other carnivores eat, if we look at the way that other animals eat each other, generally they don't just eat the muscle meat. They look for fat and they look for viscera and organs. And this conversation gets a little nuanced because as we were talking about earlier, I think that the ideas of RDAs and nutritional guidelines should not necessarily be the end all and be all, but in terms of nutrient composition and nutrient richness and nutrient, the presence of the full complement of nutrients that I think that humans need to function optimally, I think that you can ensure that you're getting that by eating more of the animal beyond the muscle meat. I think muscle meat forms a great basis of nutritional uh, you know, needs for a human, and it gets to be totally, uh, it gets to be enriched when we add things like organ meats, liver, kidney, things like this. And when we think about how much fat from the animal we're getting or where our sources of fat are getting, because we know that if we're just talking about fat to protein ratio, we can't just eat pure protein. That results in rabbit starvation, which is, you know, just this colloquial name for this biochemical conditioning of the condition of too much protein without any fat or carbohydrates. I think humans really need fat or carbohydrates as fuel. Protein is kind of the building block and that to really create the ideal sort of biochemistry, the chemical engine in a human, you wanna have fat or carbohydrate. I would argue that fat is a superior source of fuel, protein as building blocks, and then all the nutrients that you need to kind of fill in the gaps and make all the biochemical wheels and levers turn. And you get those nutrients from the other parts of the animal in conjunction with the muscle meat. Muscle meat certainly has many micronutrients. If you look at the micronutrient profile of muscle meat and compare it to something like liver, they're sort of beautifully complementary. You know, you can look at zinc and copper, for instance, or folate and other B vitamins that occur in the muscle meat, like B6. And what I'm illustrating here is that there's a lot of zinc in muscle meat, there's a lot of copper in liver, and there's a lot of folate in liver, and there's a lot of B6 in muscle meat. So if you're looking at B vitamins or minerals, 
Combining the organs of an animal with the muscle meat, in my opinion, gives you this sort of more robust, complete complement of micronutrients to make our biochemistry work. The overarching context of that is that many westernized humans now think that's gross. Why are we doing that? And I would say, you know, I've just challenged that and ask people to step back for one moment and think that it's all relative, right? You know, I think that our ancestors were doing that a few hundred years ago, certainly a few thousand years ago, and because we've become divorced from that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing it. And there are ways to do it now, ways to make it more approachable for people, but as a conceptualization, in my opinion, if you're going to eat an animal-based diet, there's a lot of richness in the organs of the animal, in the connective tissue of the animal, in the fat of the animal, beyond the muscle meat. I think muscle meat's a great thing, and I think that we can make it a full complement of nutrients for a human by adding all of the organs, as many as we can to it, in the way that our ancestors would have, I believe, and the way that animals eat. You know, I was recently hanging out with my friend in Seattle, uh, Mike Mutzel, and he said that, sadly, his chickens got eaten, some of his chickens got eaten by raccoons. But he said that the raccoons ate the viscera of the chickens, and they left everything else. And he said, that was a real wake-up call to him. I thought it was so interesting to hear that, that the raccoons went for the stomach of the chickens and they ate the liver and the gallbladder and the intestines. And, and then when we see this also in, in animals, I mean, I'm not a zoologist, but I, I like this stuff. And what we see is that, you know, animals, lions will often eat the organs first. And whether that's the fact that they're going for animal fat or animal organs, they're clearly going for something there, and then they'll often eat lots of the muscle meat too, but they'll eat the organs first. And if we look at indigenous cultures, liver and the organs are often treated as sacred, and they're eaten raw or immediately or shared among pieces in the village. Indigenous cultures that I'm aware of don't waste the organs of an animal ever. Yeah, I think only in modern society, just because of how we live in America, we think it's weird. If you look at maybe even 50 years ago, you said 100, our grandparents would eat liver. Or if you look at any other modern society, not even just the indigenous ones, they embrace the different parts of the animal. But Sean, what do you think about this? Well, it's interesting. I think, I think that is, uh, I mean, certainly if you look at it on paper, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Liver has more nutrients than, you know, say a ribeye steak is. I think, you know, Mickey Bandora wrote a nice paper called Man, or he's part, he participated in a paper called Man the Fat Hunter. And I think some of the behavior we see is certainly seeking fat because, I mean, you know, it's fairly easy if you're eating an animal-based diet, protein is not difficult to get. Protein you're going to get, you know. Uh, fat becomes more difficult. And certainly as humans evolved and we, we, we saw megafaunal die off, then we became sort of uh, left with kind of lean animals. I mean, now that we've, we can breed cows to put more fat on there, but generally the wild animals are pretty lean. And so where is a fat source is gonna be? And they're gonna be the brain, they're gonna be the uh, you know, perinephric fat, the pericardial fat, the mental fat that we see. Uh, and so I think fat is probably the main driver for that. Now, certainly if I look at you know, the weight of a, a modern cow, 2% of it is the liver by weight if we look at relative to the meat on the animal. And so I don't know that, uh, you know, how much we need to get each day. I'll just say I rarely eat organs. I almost never eat them. And I eat them when somebody has them and I'll have them. And I've been doing it for three years and I've, I've literally broken world records athletically. And so I would say I'm probably not micronutrient deficient. I mean, if that's a sign of micronutrient deficiency, it's kind of an odd one, but I mean, I think, and I've observed literally thousands upon thousands of people doing this diet and interacted with them, and I've polled them and I asked them, and you know, I mean, it's pretty evenly split. I mean, there's some people that they never do it and they seem to do just fine. Uh, there's other people that certainly, you know, feel that, yeah, I like including liver once a week. And so I think the question is unknown in my view, and I think if we go back to the RDA, what is the RDA requirements? How applicable are they? Um, I certainly think if you want to hedge your bets, it makes completely complete sense. I mean, it's, you know, like I said, if, if, if we want to say maximizing nutrient density, this is the way you do it. Now, no one's out there advocating a diet of 100% liver diet, right? We're not going to say that. I mean, you could say when, at what point do you draw the line? And I'd also say that, you know, if I were to take a biopsy of your leg, and I would say what nutrients are in it, and I would say pretty much every single one that you need to run the human body. It has to be. You know, there has to be calcium. There has to be vitamin A. Now, you could argue about the relative concentrations in the mountain. We could talk about what changes with our nutritional requirements, what changes with our absorption capacity. I mean, we don't know. I mean, the bottom line, in my view, is I don't know. And I'm just, I'll be happy to say that. And I may be completely wrong. You know, and maybe everybody should be eating liver once a week. And I, and I think from a sustainability standpoint, it certainly makes sense. I mean, you know, you know, we can take some of that food and feed it to dogs and cats and stuff like that and make it pet food. But, um, feed you know. Feed me the pet food. I'll eat the dog. Yeah, I mean, no, but I mean, no, I'm just saying that, um, you know, we have, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's most people in modern society 
Uh, and, you know, this may be an argument that, that we can make. Most people aren't eating liver. If they're on an omnivorous diet, that's not even, and, and no one talk, no one even bats an eye at that. Like, you're not eating liver every day? You know, and, and no one makes a question about that. And we're not saying all these people are dying of nutrient deficiencies, even though we're saying that plants are not very bioavailable, and so they're not developing nutrient deficiencies. So now you're saying, well, if you're on a carnivore diet, you have to include liver when no one else is. To me, that that sort of sentiment makes me scratch my head a little bit. And, and again, I may be wrong. I may be completely wrong. Um, I think that uh, animal source nutrition is so good, and it may be that you know, eggs can do it, you know, because eggs are a complete animal. And like I said, you eat a whole animal, and an egg's a whole animal, basically. You may, you may get your needs right there. There's so. a lot of good stuff in an egg yolk. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, absolutely. Sure. absolutely. Well, where, do you, where do you land on this? Oh, so um, I would say, personally, I land on uh, paying attention to the quality sources of uh, protein, first and foremost. I always find it interesting that uh, we assign a caloric value to, to protein, when in fact it, it ought primarily to be a structural material, um, and we ought to be combusting carbohydrates and fats. Uh, but I'll start with protein, and then I'll layer in some uh, healthy fats, and then again, um, add on vegetables to taste. Because I feel, in terms of like, Sean, you're hedging your bet here, or certainly Paul is with eating the organ meats, maybe not so much you. So I'm going to hedge my bet with some of the vegetables. Now, I'm aware of the goitrogenic uh, possibilities in the cruciferous vegetables. I'm aware of gluten in the grains and lectins in the legumes and tomatoes, apparently. And uh, forget the oxalates. oxalates. <laughs> and you don't, don't, forget, don't forget the oxalates. So I'm talking myself out of this right now. But, <laughs> I'm not but, sure what's left. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Avocado, maybe, right. but I'm sure we could find something right. there. Uh, so, again, but to tolerance. I mean, it's almost, it's almost back to what I s sort of started for myself, which is I want to live, you know, an awesome life. And part of an awesome life is enjoying every bite of food that I eat. So I want to be as inclusive as I can with foods. And as long as I know that they're not going to be detrimental to my health, and I'm quite, I'm quite convinced of that part, then I'll add them in as I see fit and, and as I... Um, you know, as my hedonistic sensitivities and proclivities will compel me to. You know, if that makes me less than optimal in my diet, I'm balancing gustatory pleasure with potential minor long-term 1% stuff. I think you have to solve for the highest quality of life yes, at all yes, times, you know? At all times. And that doesn't necessarily, like you're saying, I think that's great, you know? Mark's highest quality of life is here, and if he ate a fully carnivorous diet, it wouldn't be as high, you know? And so- I might live a week longer. Yeah, <laughs> but, you're, but it wouldn't be a higher quality yeah, of life. So right. people need to solve for the highest quality of life at all times, and at, at times that might be eating you know, I can't even say it, like birthday cake or something, yeah, yeah, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> but, I, you know, we know that's not going to kill you in the moment, but, you know, I, that's the context of the whole discussion, I think, sure. is what we're all trying to do here is offer information that might help people lead a higher quality of life. And people might decide, you know, for 95% of the time, I'm going to eat really well, however you define that, and that's going to be my highest quality of life, and 5% of the time, I'm going to spend time with my friends, or, you know, I want to have, you know, an avocado or some salad, or I want the crunch, or I, I want to try these things, and that's a higher quality of life, that's totally fine. But I think that is, if people are intentionally aiming for a higher quality of life and making intentional food choices based on the best science and the best information they can gather about the health qualities and the health promoting qualities of a food, I think that that's laudable in the individual. So it sounds like you guys are recommending people work on things that are 95% and don't worry about the last 5% or don't worry about the last 1% maybe. Is that where you're at? Well, I mean, I think in this concept, you know, plays in a lot of things. I mean, most people get, you know, there are some basic things you need to do to be healthy. And you need to do those, and you need to do them consistently. That's why they're called basics. But people sort of get hung up in the minutia, and then they, they start worrying about these minor things that, you know, that make 1% difference. And I think that becomes a source of anxiety. Uh, I think it can reduce your quality of life, quite honestly, if you're worrying about that. If, if I have, and Mark talked about this, we talked about it on the podcast, fitness trackers. And if you got to wear a wearable to, to know if you're healthy or not, you know, you, it's insanity. And so I think these people that, you know, their routine is they get up and they check their HRV and then they strap on their Fitbit and they look at their iPhone to figure out what macronutrients they need to eat today. To me, that is not a quality of life. I mean, that's, that's craziness. And so I think there has to be you know, some degree of intuitiveness. And I think the nice thing about uh, when you're eating a nutrient-dense, rel relatively human-appropriate diet, species-appropriate diet, those things become intuitive. And I think it's, uh, you know, we, we should be able to listen to our body. It's like every other animal in the wild. I mean, it, 
It doesn't need someone to, to present them a menu. It doesn't need them to send, to send out calorie tracker. I mean, they just do it. And I think we have the capability to do that, you know, as long as we're eating the right foods. And like I said, the thing about the organs is, you know, certainly traditional people, old people and, and, and kids and pregnant women, you know, that was a situation often where those, those things were utilized. And I think, you know, there probably are times when, well, I mean, surely we all know this, that, that different things in life require, change our nutrient requirements. And so if you have, if you have an illness or if you have, some sort of stressful event, your nutrient requirements certainly may go up. And so that may be a time where you implement these things. But, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's just we don't know for sure. And it's just the, the problem is people want to say we can tell you exactly. That's the problem with nutrition science in general. We think we can design a study that tells you what to eat for the next 50 years. going to keep make you live the longest. So that's another thing that I don't know if we're going to talk on that topic. But this whole topic of longevity, I'm like, Man, it's like religion. I mean, it's like talking religion to people. And it's, it's, you know, it's just get healthy today, stay healthy today, and then repeat. And as long as it keeps you healthy, that's what you do. And how do you define health? That's the other question. I think Mark has it pretty well. Lean muscle mass, enjoyment in life, not being hungry, and having energy. And I think that's really as complicated as it needs to be in many cases. Yeah, I really agree with a lot of that. But back to just the nose and tail part, I think I agree more with Paul and the intuitive part, in, in through all of history, it was intuitive for us to eat the whole animal. So yes, I mean, nowadays it's a little bit different, but I mean, if we're talking about what we probably did do and should be doing, then it probably was eating the whole animal. Well, I mean, I would say if you go back into history, we're mostly looking at indigenous tribes, and usually indigenous tribes, modern ones, which we've actually observed, I mean, these people are living on the fringes. They were they're living a subsistence uh, uh, lifestyle, so they weren't living in a time of abundance. And so we don't know. I mean, when there's different nutrient stat strategies, even in animals, when things are abundant. And so when they have plenty of food, they tend not to do the same things. And so humans probably acted the same way. And so, again, I'm just I'm at the point where I say I just don't know because I can posit a scenario where, uh, you know, you've got man on the, uh, you know, the Eurasian steppes and there's mammoths everywhere and we're good at killing them. We're like, bam, there's a mammoth and I got food for the next three months and I'll eat what I want. And then when I run out, I'll eat something else and maybe I don't like the eyeballs, you know, or something like that. So, um, you know, why do some people find organ meats distasteful, like kidneys? Some people like that, they're, they're awful. Why do we have that? Why wouldn't we just savor that? Well, I mean, what is that? And if we had a choice of something else, it's it's out there that's, you know, I mean, because most of us would argue a nice fatty ribeye tastes pretty damn friggin' good. And, you know, if we had fire and meat back then, we had that available to us. And you might have said, you might have preferentially picked that. Again, I don't know. I mean, this is speculation. I think a lot of that's cultural. I think Could a lot be, of yeah. the, the distaste or the perceived or the predicted distaste for some of these things is cultural. Um, you know, why do uh, people in the Philippines love thousand-year-old eggs but hate cheese? You know, it's a cultural thing. That's what we're used to. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. I mean, I, I, I just think we don't know. I mean, it's interesting to see. And again, I'll go back to the observations. I, I, I can show you humans have been leaving on ribeye steaks for 20 years and man, they look good. I mean, they're doing well. They look 20 years younger than their reported age. And you know, it's like, okay, how do I explain that? Faster on the uh, erg if we gave you some liver. You, you know, well, we can do that experiment. <laughs> we can do that experiment. One more minute. On. No. All right, so we'll just do like two minutes on longevity, and then I'm just going to ask each person to close out on the what meat, just meat. So with longevity, a lot of these people, they say, okay, may, maybe meat is healthy, but maybe we should be limiting it because there's mTOR, there's IGF-1, or they, you know, they make up all these little, they get into these minutia over some study that says something that says, oh, you're going to live a shorter time. So where do we stand with longevity? Well, the longevity question as it relates to meat, I think it's a non-issue. I think mTOR has been, uh, again, all these things are, they exist on a spectrum and some uh, expression of mTOR is phenomenal and necessary for growth and some of it is a little bit too much and probably problematic. Um, I don't think that a uh, diet that's based on animal protein is of necessity going to cause issues with mTOR or any other signaling pathway. Um, and in terms of longevity, I would look at more, I don't look at meat, for instance, and protein on a meal-to-meal -meal basis. Like, do I get 20 grams this meal or 30 grams this meal? Or what's the most that my body can process in one meal? I look at protein and amino acids in particular in, in this great pool, this vast reservoir that we have, on maybe a three and four day cycle. So as long as I get 350 grams of protein over the course of three or four days, I know I'm good. And it doesn't matter that I didn't have any one day, that I had 200 grams the next day. It sort of evens out. 
I think the body has a great ability. We can sequester energy in the form of fat. So fat goes into fat cells. Carbohydrate goes into glycogen stores. So we have this ability to take all these different things and save them for later, right? And I think we, we do that with protein. So I don't, in terms of longevity and protein, I want to make sure I maintain my muscle mass, right? I, that's a definer of longevity. If I don't have muscle mass, then I lose organ reserve. Now, what that means is over time, as I get older and older, if I don't maintain muscle mass, then if I start to atrophy, then my heart goes, you know what, I don't need to pump that much. My lungs go, you know what, I don't need to breathe that deeply. My liver says, I don't need to process that much. And the next thing, and my bones go, I don't need to be that strong, he's not doing that much. And over time, you lose organ reserve. Then, where you get into trouble, you know, you're 80, 85 years old, you get up in the middle of the night to take a leak, you trip over the cat, you break a hip, you get pneumonia, you can't cough out the sputum, you get congestive heart failure. That's what happens. People rarely really die of old age. They die of some, some organ that gave out finally because the organ reserve wasn't enough to sustain. And that goes back to muscle mass. So I want to maintain muscle mass. And to do that, I need to do the work, I need to exercise, and I need to have enough of the structural components and amino acids to make that happen. Yeah, let me pick up, let me pick back onto that because I think it's important. If we talk about how do we build muscle, what are the requirements? We know that you know you have to stimulate M4, but you need leucine to do it. You need a certain amount of leucine, and you need a, you know a complement of a full complement of amino acids. You have to have enough enough calories. It doesn't have to be too much, but you have to have enough. And so when we're looking at what's the best way to get your leucine in, and that's going to be almost clearly you know the, the indispensable amino acids are going to come from animal sources. So if you're going to maintain your muscle mass outside of animal nutrition, you're going to have to eat even more protein to do that to get the, the right amount. It's like building a car out of car parts versus building a car out of computer parts. I mean, yeah, you might be able to scrape enough plastic and metal out of a computer, but you're gonna need 100 times as many computers than you are with a car that's already sitting there. So if we're talking about stimulating mTOR with regards to longevity or cancer, uh, you know, it's like, what's the best source of protein that I'm gonna need to do that? Because we still wanna stimulate mTOR. Uh, you know, our muscle building capacity revolves around mTOR and we wanna do that, and we can couple that with resistance training or something that stimulates muscle growth versus too much excess of mTOR stimulation through excess of calories, excess of insulin, the wrong types of protein, and then perhaps you know stimulating mTOR in tissues where we don't want to stimulate, like our liver and things like that. So I think when it comes to longevity, um, it's more nuanced. You know, Anytime we learn something new, everybody kind of has this reflex of, oh my gosh, mTOR seems to be related to uh, problems with uh, growth and overgrowth and cancer, and then we gotta, we gotta make it zero. And we know that if you give low-dose rapamycin to people, they have problems with sarcopenia because it's, it's, it's non-discriminatory. But whereas in the real world, in the real human body, which is far more complex than any of us ever imagined, it's more nuanced than that. And so you can't just, it's not binary. You just can't shut it all off completely and expect good things to happen. We need both mTOR signaling and the complement to mTOR. mTOR is kind of anabolic. There are complementary catabolic signals, which are like AMPK. As Sean is mentioning, rapamycin is an inhibitor of mTOR. And I think in lower animal models, there are suggestions that giving rapamycin can prolong life. I think as humans, in the scientific world, we've become too enamored with these like worm studies and mouse studies where we're prolonging the life. You know, they can do caloric restriction studies on mice and they prolong the life of the mouse. And I think that we understand a lot of those mechanisms. We certainly don't understand all of them. It might involve the sirtuin genes. They might have involved some differential control of mTOR. But when you look at mTOR, and again, this is a very simplified, oversimplified uh, system and we don't fully understand this, but there are these sort of two competing families of genes. And if you look at the relative contributions of stimulation of mTOR, of leucine, which is the most anabolic amino acid, and insulin, which is what you're gonna get from eating carbohydrates. As we talked about earlier, you can fuel the car with either fat or carbohydrate. You don't have a choice. So, and you're always gonna get some protein. And so the idea is that if you are giving yourself carbohydrates, your insulin is going to be higher. We know that is a pretty linear correlation. And if you look at the relative contributions of mTOR activation of leucine and insulin, it's very clear. Uh, that insulin is much more robust and much more long-lasting. So one of the things I think is a great irony about this discussion regarding longevity and animal protein is that none of the people talking about it ever talk about the contribution of insulin to the activation of mTOR because if they're limiting animal protein, then they have to be eating something. Mm -hmm. And it certainly is carbohydrates. They're not just living on fat. So they're using carbohydrates. That is going to signal mTOR in a larger way. 
if you look at IGF-1 levels, IGF-1 being insulin-like growth factor 1, which is one of the ligands for the IGF-1 receptor downstream from the IGF-1 receptor in the human body, is the mTOR cascade. So IGF-1 could trigger mTOR. So sometimes we measure IGF-1 in the human body. What we see is that when people are fasting and they're not taking in any food, the IGF-1 levels are around 100 or 90. They go pretty low. But when people are eating ketogenic diets or high animal foods, diets without carbohydrates, the IGF-1 levels don't go through the roof. They're sort of intermediate. But the highest IGF-1 levels are observed when people are eating mixed diets with both protein and fat and carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are going to push the IGF-1 higher than a solely animal-based diet. So there's a great irony in the discussion if we're just getting granular around IGF and mTOR. But both Mark and Sean make great points that we know that protein restriction leads to loss of lean muscle mass, which is called sarcopenia. We know that inhibition of mTOR with rapamycin can lead to sarcopenia. And we know that sarcopenia is a predictor of poor functional outcomes as we age. And so this whole discussion, I think, loses the forest for the trees. We're not mice, we're not worms. Really, nobody wants to live to 150 if they're living to 150 with like a crappy quality of life, and I'm not even sure that that's the, necessarily the trade-off in the first place. If we just get a little more granular for a moment, what we've found, and this is quite an interesting nuance, is that the benefits of caloric restriction appear to be the sirtuin family of genes, and we can mimic those if we're in ketosis. And so we can get the benefits of caloric restriction now without caloric restricting. We just have to maybe adjust the macros a little bit, and it's quite easy to do if you're doing you know, a well-constructed primal diet, a well-constructed animal-based diet, you can be activating the sirtuin family of genes, mimicking caloric restriction in a, in a longevity-based way in an animal-based diet. That kind of turns the whole thing on its head. <laughs> uh, we're good here. What are your last messages for people who are just, this may be new to them, they haven't heard of that meat could be okay to eat. They think it is unhealthy. What is sort of a, a message from each of you that you know, what would you think about it? How can you wrap it up? Well, for me, um, it always starts with what can you eliminate from your diet first um, as you're going to layer on meat. So if you're going to be, you know, eating a lot of industrial seed oils and sugar-based products and grain-based products and then adding a lot of meat, you're going to go down the wrong path. You're going to, you're going to be, it's going to be counterproductive. So the first thing in any diet that works, and by the way, this works across the board with ways of eating, it's what you don't eat that has the greatest effect on your health. So if you can eliminate the industrial seed oils, that's corn oil, soybean oil, canola oil, all those processed franken oils. If you can get rid of sugars, not just pies, cakes, candies, cookies, you know, sweets, but sweetened beverages, things like that. And if you can get rid of or reduce your consumption of grains, grain-based products, wheat, you know, rye, millet, corn, and come down to real food, then we can talk about how much added meat-centric eating program will benefit you. I think that's great. I think that's a great start for people. I think the first step is eliminating the processed foods. Most people know that. And then I think the second step is kind of like we were talking about earlier, realizing that animal foods, in my opinion, I think all of our opinions are the ultimate multivitamin. And that even does it a little bit of injustice to call it a multivitamin, but I think it's a way to kind of get your head around it. I think that if we're thinking about animal foods, they are the ultimate multivitamin. And so I think most people can understand that if the more of my vitamins I eat, the more nutrients I get, the better I'm gonna feel. So if you eliminate the crap and you put more of the good stuff in, I think that's a pretty darn simple equation for living better in a lot of ways. Yeah, I would say just if we look at nutrition in general, I mean, there's never been a long-term randomized controlled trial of any diet ever that can tell you what to eat to live longer. And so, I mean, if you're going to wait on some scientist to define the ultimate study that's going to tell you what to eat, you're going to be waiting till long after you're dead. And so I would say, you know, try it and see how it does. I mean, there's really no harm. I mean, if you spend, you know, 90 days eating a bunch of steaks and maybe some liver, the worst thing's going to be happen is you're going to enjoy a bunch of meals. And I think that's, that's how I'd look at that. I love it. I guess, yeah, the, I just hope for people who haven't heard this before that they, you know, listen to these smart guys around me and that at least be open to this and don't listen to just the mass media that may not always have your interests in there. Or if you do listen to the mass media, think about the context and think about where it's coming from and kind of question the validity of the studies and what they all mean. So question things, try things for yourself, yeah. live awesome. Stay live radical. radical. Stay radical. Do you have a tagline? <laughs> I don't have a tagline. No. <laughs> all right, let's do it. Okay, stay tuned, everyone. We'll be editing down some of this and putting it out on YouTube. Don't forget to RSVP for the meetup in San Diego at nosetail.org slash event. And also check out the awesome grass-finished meat we're selling there. Have you rated or reviewed this podcast on iTunes or your podcast app yet? 
If not, it's the freest and easiest way to support me. You can still get a copy of the Food Lies film on Indiegogo, and you can still follow Food Lies on social media where a lot is going on daily. Check out all the new highlight pieces on some of the experts interviewed for the film on YouTube. And until next time, eat densely and move intensely, my friends. Break, break, break.